Argentina has a new president-elect. He is an anarcho-capitalist businessman, TikTok sensation, who seemingly came out of nowhere. Mr. Malay, known as El Loco, or the madman, pulled off a major upset. Well, they call him the madman, the wig, and as of next week, they're going to be calling him Mr. President. 53-year-old Javier Millet is Argentina's next leader and has been described as their version of Donald Trump. But that really doesn't do him justice. Millet is even more, shall we say, unusual than Mr. Trump. He claims his dead dog told him to run for the presidency. Good advice. He won it by a mile. And he wants to do some truly revolutionary things, including getting rid of the central bank. Is he mad, bad, or does he actually have a plan to save his country? <laughs> Argentina is a cautionary tale of a once prosperous society mm -hmm. that can go down so quickly. Buenos Aires was one of the richest cities in the world less than a century ago. Fast forward to today, and the country finds itself in the clutches of one of the most severe economic crises in two decades. Desperate times call for drastic measures. A seismic political shift is underway in Argentina. Javier Millet. Javier Millet. Javier Millet. He's a former soccer star, goalie. He fronted a Rolling Stones rock band. He is a radical libertarian. The context for all this, of course, is that Argentina has been a basket case you know, for a very, very long time. Argentina has become the poster child of economic failure. 40% are living under the poverty line. Inflation is 140%. The interest rate is 140%. You know what? F this. So the people are desperate, and all of a sudden this guy talks about being the one guy that's got the balls to walk in and do it, and 55.7% say, that's my guy. Yo no me metí acá para estar guiando corderos. Yo me metí acá para despertar leones. Before rattling Argentinian politics, Javier Millet was a TV pundit. He says he gets advice from his English mastiffs, cloned from his dearly departed dog Conan. Some say he's barking mad. First of all, he looks like an Argentinian uh, Elvis Presley. Thank you very much. But watch what he's saying. No, si ustedes no recitan el socialismo cool, si ustedes no son woke, entonces son violentos. Son un peligro para la democracia. Vamos, muchacho. Seguro. Sigamos con estas estupideces y, y en lugar de ser 140, vamos a hacer la villa miseria más grande. He's really on fire, and the shock therapy is going to be necessary. He plans to abolish the central bank slash government spending and replace the national currency, the peso, with the U.S. dollar. I don't even know. It could be a total disaster with this guy. Yes. But we got to do something. What do you have to lose? This is our chance to think long term, because maybe with this government there is hope. His critics say his election is a disaster for democracy. Malay supporters say his libertarian policies herald a new dawn for the nation. Al zurdo de no le podés dar ni un milímetro. Pero, pero me podés definir zurdo de que no Todos lo los que, digamos, los colectivistas, <risa> los que ponen, digamos, o sea, esa idea. A ver, ¿Por es... qué le pones de digamos? Porque son una He wants to take a chainsaw to the government. <risa> Honestly, this is giving me hope. Ministerio de Transporte, afuera. Ministerio de Salud, afuera. He wants to loosen gun laws, abolish abortion, allow the uh, free market sale of organs. La libertad avanza. Viva la libertad, carajo! The people are rising up against these so-called elites. I think he makes Trump almost look like a conventional political candidate, and that says something. The whole world was watching, and I am very proud of you. You will turn your country around and truly make Argentina great again. Congratulations. Se acabó el curro de la política. Viva la libertad, carajo! Okay, let's bring in our guest now. And in Buenos Aires, we have Juan Iroman, a director of Infomedia Consulting, which specializes in political strategy and communications. In Boston, we have Patrick Boyle, a professor of finance and economics. And finally, in London, we have Javier Fahe, a journalist and historian who specializes in Latin American politics. Welcome to all three of you. Uh, Juan, if I may start with you, one of our 
uh, panel members here describes the, uh, the next president of Argentina as a monster. Uh, not uh, out of keeping, frankly, with the coverage we have in the West, uh, in the liberal media, both in the United States uh, and in the United Kingdom. They describe him as, uh, describe him as far right, as mad and bad, and as the next Donald Trump. Your description, sir. I think uh, more than a monster is a master, I would say. Uh, keep in mind that 54% of the population in Argentina voted for him. 50, 56, correct. I'm correcting myself. Um, and... Um, I think a master, when I say the master, is because he, he was uh, very, very capable in terms of uh, conducting a campaign and being able to deliver his messages. And keep in mind this, uh, Argentina was in a, an economic crisis for more than a de decade. It was, its GDP was flat for 11 years. Can you imagine this? 150% of uh, inflation per year and uh, more than 40% of the population under the line of poverty. So being in this situation for more than a decade, uh, people thought, listen, we need to vote someone different and um, is far from being a monster, is, is someone that is proposing something different. Uh, keep in mind that for ages, we had a, a very close economy. I think uh, um, Argentina is one of the most um, conservative countries in, in terms of uh, having a very, very close economy, very uh, protectionist economy. And this person is just proposing to open the, 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 the markets to celebrate um, uh, trade agreements with hundreds of countries and to open the economy and to move to the next stage. So Javier. far, in, in my opinion, is, is not at all uh, a monster. Javier, he's not a monster. He's the expression of the people's will. I use the word monster advisedly uh, as a definition rather than as an insult. What I'm trying to say is that he's, in a way, the creation of the failure of a political and economic system which has let Argentinians down. He is, as our colleague in Buenos Aires said, something new, something different, somebody who's promised to solve the very problems that the current Peronista uh, government has not been able to solve. High inflation, uh, a, a bloated, huge uh, public sector, which is incompetent and also corrupt. Uh, a, central bank has not, a central bank, which has not fulfilled its commitment, has increased inflation by printing money, which is more than is required in, within the market, in, in internal market in Argentina. And he is the result of the need that people have to get something new. So when I use the word monster, I'm talking about the creation of mm. this politician that comes from the failure of a system which has not fulfilled expectations of Argentinians. It remains to be seen whether the rhetoric that he used during the campaign and before that is going to be implemented, it's going to become policies within government because the realities of government will might shock him and he might have to tone down some of the proposals he's made, yes. like the like yes. this, you know, like closing down the central bank and things like that. So yes, that's the that's I, that's why I use that word. I used it advisedly. I actually. understand. It's, just, it's a subtle difference. I appreciate that. Um, Patrick, uh, the, the mainstream media say, particularly in, in New York Times, for example, um, and, and other papers, they say that uh, Argentina is bracing itself for uh, his tenure. But if you look at uh, the, the general uh, reaction on the bond markets and on the stock markets, uh, the Argentinian stocks listed uh, in the New York Stock Exchange, for example, um, it seems to be quite favorable. Well, I think any anything that looks like it could open up an economy tends to be viewed positively by investors. In truth, when I spoke to in, in researching uh, before this call, I spoke to a number of EM investors that I know, and they said to me they knew next to nothing about Argentina just because it's so uninvestable and has been for so long. Like it's not even worth paying attention to for investors. So anything that changes that can be viewed positively just because it's, you know, it's sort of in a situation along with places like Lebanon that, that people don't even look at. Um, and anything that looks like it could improve that is of interest to investors. Yeah. Uh, Juan, do you think that uh, Javier Millet can change uh, the world's uh, impression uh, of, of Argentina? I think so. I think he's a very good communicator. Uh, he was successful in, in communication, communicating his proposals to the population. Now he has a challenge. One of the challenges is uh, 
the, that many of the mainstream uh, media around the world are uh, positioning him, uh, Millet as, a, as a, someone who's a, or a crazy man or someone that is a, has a populist uh, 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 narrative. And, and I think it's quite the opposite. Um, so uh, it will depend on the way in which uh, journalists and, and, and politicians and, and uh, opinion leaders approach him and if, the, if prejudice still they are very, very uh, present or, or someone is open to, to listen and to hear and to, and to see if there is something really different uh, when we see Javier but Millet. He's partly to blame for this impression, isn't he? I mean, his nickname is the Madman or the Whig. He says uh, in public, I don't know if it's a joke or not, but he says that his dead dog told him to run for the presidency. Um, he goes around campaigning with a chainsaw. Uh, he looks uh, and acts like a madman, and you're saying, but privately, he's quite an intelligent man, isn't he? I mean, professor of, yeah, of economics as well. It's, 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 it's quite, quite interesting. Um, keep in mind that uh, you have, it's different when you talk about the suffering and the anger and the anxiety of people versus when you embody that. So I think he was very smart by doing that, by uh, showing that level of anxiety and, uh, and uh, anger in, in the population. And again, the reasons uh, why people is that frustrated is because we had uh, this uh, very long crisis for, for, for years and years, mm. and it's, it's in a level that is um, impossible to continue. You know, 150% of, of uh, inflation is hard to imagine in the rest of the world. Uh, and here is becoming kind of normal. People thought, oh, he's different. I'm gonna trust him this time because he's new. He's not the, like the rest. He's not uh, one of the typical politicians. Remember that he was able to create his own party um, just three years ago, two years ago, he became a deputy, a member of the, of the Congress. And two weeks ago, he became, uh, he's uh, the elected president. So he is not a, pol a classic politician. He comes from outside and he is becoming uh, like a, a real representative of people. That's actually a strength for him, isn't it? Um, but the comparison with Donald Trump is, is, is a little bit facile, isn't it? Because uh, Donald Trump actually took command of the Republican Party, one of the duopoly that controlled American politics, whereas he started his own movement. Um, I would just say that his campaign persona and his uh, actual personality, if you like, is very different. Let's have a listen to him in a much more considered conversation with Tucker Carlson. Argentina empezó a abrazar las ideas del socialismo y con una frase que luce muy atractiva, pero que es terrorífica en términos de funcionamiento del sistema económico, que es la idea que donde hay una necesidad nace un derecho. Y eso es un problema porque las necesidades son infinitas y los derechos alguien los tiene que pagar. Y el problema es que los recursos son finitos. Entonces, frente a la situación de necesidades infinitas y recursos finitos, aparece un conflicto. So Patrick, clearly this is a leader who recognizes the economic problems in Argentina are paramount in people's minds. And to that end, he has a couple of different ideas. Um, one of them is getting rid of various government departments. Another one is dollarizing the economy. Now, what does that mean? Well, that basically just means using the US dollar, like getting rid of the, the currency of Argentina and replacing it with just everyone using the US dollar, which it's an interesting thing because to a certain extent, the Argentine economy is already reasonably dollarized in that if you were to buy or sell a house in Argentina, you wouldn't uh, set a price in, in local currency because you wouldn't exchange a, a hard asset like a house for a rapidly depreciating asset like the Argentinian currency. So um, it's basically almost just formalizing that re relationship, saying that we're no longer going to pretend to have a currency and people will just use the currency of a different country uh, to, to exchange value. I've heard that other countries in Latin America, Ecuador, Panama, El Salvador, have tried this. Has it been successful? It hasn't been unsuccessful, I guess you would say. Like, normally, it's not considered a great idea to use another 
country's currency as your own simply because um, they will run their monetary policy for their own country, not for the benefit of a foreign country. But the reason it might make sense is just if your central bank is already a disaster, if inflation is run away, if the people of the country have lost faith in the currency, it becomes a thing that, that can work and, uh, you know, sometimes works. The, the truth is there would probably be a longer term goal to return to having right. your own currency, but it's it's not. It's not an awful idea, even though uh, for most countries you would say it Although, would be a terrible idea, but it could be reasonable in Argentina. So in one scenario, if the US dollar becomes much stronger, then Argentine um, exporters will suffer. Yes, well, that that is the entire problem, is that if your um, business cycle is out of sync with the country whose currency you have adopted, um, the monetary policy won't work very well for you. You'll, you'll be experiencing either overheated or uh, stomped down upon markets based upon what the Federal Reserve is doing. Right. Juan, uh, it's, it's mentioned in a number of publications that Argentina doesn't have the dollars to go into dollarization. So if they don't, what's the solution? Millet is saying that the dollarization, if it comes, is not going to come now. Uh, the first thing to do is to uh, generate conditions to uh, uh, equalize the, the prices, because we have crazy situations like uh, uh, one kilogram of sugar is, has the same uh, price of, uh, let's say, a gallon of, 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 uh, of gasoline, something like that. So there are, there are things that are, there are prices that are like retrain, retrained. There are, there are things that are extremely, extremely cheap and other things that are extremely uh, uh, expensive. So what we are gonna need is a, 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 a few months of stabilization in which we are gonna continue having very high inflation. Mm -hmm. um, then we are gonna have something normalized. Then we, we are gonna be able to put in place an economic plan that is gonna bring um, uh, or they are trying to bring investments and 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 st starting moving the economy, and then dollarization will be like in the third third uh, stage. So it's something that okay. it will be, be happy now. H have you yeah. just the, a quick comment from you about dollarization, and then we'll move on to the uh, the idea of abolishing the central bank. Well, as, as our guest said, I mean, there's a debate about whether it's good or bad. I mean, those who are in favor think that you can control inflation better because the central bank will not have to print local currency beyond its capabilities or the mm. capabilities of the market. Other people say no, because the, dollar, the currency will, the Argentina will become, uh, will be submitted to the fluctuations of the dollar in international markets, and that might affect the economy. It's a long debate that we cannot solve here, and it would be too long to discuss. The question is how he's going to do it. As our colleague said, he hasn't said exactly how he's going to do it, but mm. also there's an important element. His position is that he wants to abolish the central bank. Now, he cannot abolish the central bank willy-nilly. He has to go to Congress, and Congress will have to approve that, and we don't know what he will have enough votes to achieve that. Juan, that's a good point. I mean, uh, he doesn't, Javier Millet does not enjoy a, a great presence in the Congress at all. In fact, he has a, a tiny presence in the Congress. So how would he go about enacting these financial plans? He needs, he needs a, an agreement with other political bodies or political parties. He already has an agreement with the PRO, which is the, the, the political party who, who, in which Macri, the former president, is leading. Uh, so that's part of the thing. The other part is that he needs to bring more people to the table because otherwise it's not going to be enough to move anywhere. Um, he's engaging in conversations with part of the uh, provincial forces because some of the governors are um, independent, are not part of the Pernice Party, nor part of the Millenni uh, Millet, nor part of the Pro, but there are provincial uh, parties. Let's say he can do it. Patrick, what is a central bank that can't print money and doesn't control its interest rates? Well, it, it would, I guess, be involved in, uh, you know, managing the banks within the country, uh, putting regulation in place, things like that. Like, obviously, it would be a very pared down version of what we think of as, as a central bank, because 
um, a, a lot of the functions of the central bank would be outsourced to uh, the United States, essentially. Juan, we, we hear about the inflation rate. Um, what we don't hear about quite as often is that two out of five Argentinians are living in poverty. Um, what is, how do you define poverty in those circumstances? Poverty is, is uh, not being able to buy basic needs, not being able to pay all the bills, being in a situation in which the day, let's say 15 or 20 of each month, you start thinking how you're going to go to the supermarket, what other expense you're going to cut, um, how you're going to finance your, your basic goods. Uh, and then you see people trying to get a second job, a third job, in, a, in able to get that. Mm. And uh, in many cases, they are receiving some kind of help from the, from the government. Um, so that is poverty. And Argentina uh, is one of the few countries in Latin America that was, was not in that situation if, some years ago. So that's why this, this contrast is we are in a, this deterioration process for ages. And that's why the unrestlessness and the anger and the, and the anxiety of society. And, and Javier, that, that, that was one of the uh, points of the campaign, that Argent Argentina uh, once enjoyed economic prosperity and has an abundance of natural resources. Uh, what happened? Well, there was mismanagement, oh. mismanagement of the economy. Uh, there was a bad sort of business practices Exports was, was, were affected by different events in Latin America. COVID affected that as well. You know, the export suffered as a, as a result of that. As I said, a great deal of incompetence from the government in order to promote a more free trade. Lack of free trade agreements with other sort of uh, countries in the world. Uh, and not efficient policies within Mercosur, the biggest trading bloc in Latin America, where uh, Argentina is a, is a very important part. They didn't actually achieve all the agreements, the trade agreements that would have helped the economy in Argentina. The, the, new president, they, the, the new president puts it perhaps more concisely. He says it's really down to the evils of socialism. Well, he thinks that uh, climate change is a lie com uh, concocted by socialists. I mean, he blames everything on communists, which don't, he sees communism all over, all over, all over the place. And, but there is none. He doesn't want to work with Lula because he's a communist. He's not a communist. So we have a problem there in terms of how he defines communism and, and all that. I mean, if you believe that climate change is a lie concocted by the cop socialists, well, I, yeah, I'm talking about, unquote, the, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, the ruin of the Argentinian economy. He puts that down to socialism. Yeah, that's true. Correct, but the Veronistas were never socialists as such. They were never communists. They were just incompetent. They, 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 were, they recycled their own ideology many times, the Peronistas, from the moment uh, sort of uh, Peron lived until recently. It was sometimes left-wing, sometimes right-wing. But the, the common element in this is incompetence. It's sheer incompetence and a lot of corruption within the government. You don't think it's, a, it's, not the founding, a it's not the foundational principles? Patrick, can I have your input on this? Well, the, you know, Argentina was a prosperous country, and these terrible ideas came in where everything is controlled. Either prices are being fixed, uh, exchange rates are being fixed. Uh, you know, there were ideas that exporting and importing were bad ideas. Um, all, all of this stuff, it's, it's disastrous economically. And really, the, you know, the benefit of change is just this idea that there might be a move towards free markets where things trade at a price determined by their supply and demand, and the Argentinian people can export goods. You know, there's a huge amount of goods that can be exported from the country, but even the soybean producers, you know, they firstly get a different uh, foreign exchange rate to other people, but then they'll hold back their soybeans and not export mm -hmm. them, waiting for a, a better exchange rate. And this grinds the entire country's economy to a halt. And so, a lot of his arguments are just throwing out all of these pointless rules, this attempt to control the economy and to sort of push everything into a box and just say, let the free market rip and let let people produce goods that are in demand and sell them to people who are willing to pay for them. On well, just a final question, I'm sure everybody on the panel is uh, rooting for Argentina to get back on its feet. Um, is it a society that's prepared to make the changes that Millet says are necessary? And if so, how long do you think it will be until we can see an appreciable difference? 
It's a great question. Uh, uh, he has the political the political uh, credit now, uh, but as, but as you know, um, uh, honeymoons for politicians are becoming very very short. He's going to start showing some reforms that is that are not going to have any kind of impacts in the next few months. So we need to we know that we are going to start seeing the fruits of this probably in a year or a year and a half. So the challenge is how to keep people happy or at least uh, not desperate for, for a year until they start seeing the results of the reforms. Juan Romain, Patrick Boyle and Javier Fahey, thank you all so much for your contributions today, much appreciated. And thank you at home on your phones for watching. If you want to see this episode or any of our previous episodes, do go to our channel on YouTube, just type in Nexus TRT World. Until next week then, goodbye.